Thank you all. I would like to thank Dr. Jackson and, and all the organizers for this program for being willing to include me. I'm kind of a newbie to, um, to Ohio State. I almost said UAB because that's where I was some months ago. Um, and actually, I was sitting there thinking, because you see my, my notes were on the old letterhead, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to stand up in front of Ohio State and say I didn't have the right format. But I did. I fixed it. So sometimes we do things in spite of ourselves. So just a real quick summary. My, my background has been quite varied. I started as a study coordinator. I even started in behavioral research, even though my background was nursing. Um, I moved to the emergency department. We did some animal studies, um, evolved. But all through this, education has been a thread that, to me, was always missing in what we did, because we have not been rigorous at providing education to ourselves, to our colleagues, to our PIs, to our coordinators, to our regulatory staff. So this sort of program is just, it's paramount to what, what we need to be doing now and in the future. So Carolyn did a really good job of sort of leading into what I was going to talk about, and that's quality management plans. Um, you know, it, if you think about what we do, you know, I think all of you, and I will repeat this, you probably all double check yourselves on a lot of the things you do, right? But do you do it in a systematic way? So that is really what clinical quality management plans are about. It's like systematically making sure you double check yourself that you have good quality data. Uh, we've looked at the, you know, Dr. London talked earlier today and we've heard it uh, from Chris as well, the cost of clinical research is outrageous. And if we don't figure out a way to do what we do better, to have less waste, we're going to fail. And what we're, and what we're trying to do is um, we won't be successful and the clinical trials will eventually, they're not going to fade away, but it's going to really change the industry. So a couple things I would talk about um, before we get started. I'm, I'm working with a group who's, and we'll talk, I'll talk about this later, but who's trying to set up an accreditation process for clinical research sites. And one of the leaders of the group has often referred to uh, what Philip Crosby, who in the 50s was doing a lot with um, engineering of, I'm sorry, manufacturing, trying to improve the quality of manufacturing. And the one thing that he talked about was, it's called zero defect attitude. Now, can we have zero defects? No. But the, one of the discussions we had was, well, okay, one of the, the ways of looking at, at problems is to be able to say, well, if we have 95%, 95% 95 of what we do is good and we only have 5% error rate, then maybe that's okay. Maybe. It depends what you're looking at. You also have to think about the fact, what if you're an ICU nurse and you're taking care of babies and you say in your head, well, 95% is fine. And if we lose 5%, that's okay. But that's not okay. And I, but keep in mind the word attitude, zero defect. That simply means we have to constantly strive to make sure we do the best we can so that we, we're all going to make mistakes, things are going to happen, we're going to have protocol deviations, they're not bad, they give, us a, they give us guidance on how we can do what we do better. So again, quality is, is really a, um, it's sort of a moving target, but it's something we all need to be involved in. And so when it comes to quality management plans, this is going to be our focus. How can we do what we do better? How can we assure that our, our data is good, that our subjects are safe? We just constantly have to be trying to reevaluate that. So again, a quality management plan is really an internal document where you, at your site, with your team, with a protocol, how are you going to make sure, how are you going to double check that you did everything right? I think of some examples of investigators and investigative teams who could have used such a plan. We recently, um, it and out, so most of my, ex my examples will come from Alabama, so nobody here would have been part of them. So, but I'm not using names, I'm protecting the innocent here. Um, an investigator who had, she had an R01. She had enrolled 150 subjects, she was getting ready to do the final study report, 
It was a drug study, so she did also have the IND, but it was only a single site. Lo and behold, every one of her consent forms was wrong. And the issue is, if she, had, in, in the sense that she didn't sign some of them, some of the dates were wrong because the subjects didn't put the date down, if she had had an internal means to double check herself, she would have caught, she would have probably had some of those problems. She would have caught it early. So in the end, she couldn't use her data. She, she tried to send the consent, then they did try to send consents to the subjects to make sure, to have them reconsent because they were all out of the study but most of them didn't return them. So she lost all that data. But again, had she had an internal means to double check herself, it wouldn't have happened. Or she, again, she would have caught it early. Um, we had another study that we realized early on, and this was one of the things that I did at UAB was I was a project director for a collaborative antiviral study group. We did viral research inter uh, nationally, internationally. We did not do AIDS because they have their own bucket of money, but we, had, we did other viruses, CMV, West Nile, flu. Um, this was in the late 90s, and we had done a study where it was a PK, it was a sub-study to a major trial and it was a PK sub-study. Lo and behold, at the end of the study, we realized, and again, um, there were only a couple of sites involved because it was a multi-center study, and we weren't doing remote data checking. We didn't have um, that mechanism. It was all hard copies coming in. They hadn't recorded any of the times of the PK draws. Well, that whole study was for nothing because we didn't check as we were going along. We didn't take the time to make sure all the required critical data was available. And I, just to repeat, it's okay to make mistakes, but you gotta check it and make it better. Or we really, we lose a lot of time and a lot of effort. So, as I go through this, this is all gonna be, after all the wonderful presentations today, mine is somewhat watered down, but I'm hoping it's very, hopefully useful and will get you thinking about building quality management plans. The other thing is I have a bunch of tools that I probably will send to Rob so they can be posted on, um, on the CCTS website for purposes of nail, I'll be Word documents so you can modify them however you like. But I think that's gonna be the, the best way to, to, again, give you some tools to move forward with. Oh, do you know what? I left my blinker down there, but let me see if I can. Yeah, Carolyn, I. <laughs> I knew I'd make a mistake. I told Rob after he told me how easy it was. I said, well, make sure I get this right. If I close the, <laughs> excuse me. Hang on a second, everyone. All right, Let's see, I'm not, I'm not technically savvy here. All right, so what I hope you will learn from this presentation is why CQMPs are important and expected. The basics of CQMPs, tools for it that you might use and look, about, look at, and the future of quality management in clinical trials and how you as a site need to be involved in this. I'm going to talk about some of the regulations. I'll kind of skim through these because I don't want to read them verbatim, but just so you know, the regulations do address quality. So this is from the, um, the current version of the ICHGCPs. And if, if you all don't know this, you know, we often, I'm going to talk about ICHGCP, and people often say, but what about the FDA? When you hold the two documents up to each other, they're really mirror images. It's just that the FDA is so much harder to read. The, the FDA guidelines and the, um, the code for federal regulations, they're much harder to read. So I tend to look at the ICHGCPs. They're more detailed. Um, and I think as has been mentioned, the, um, the Code for Federal Regulations do tend to also be vague. And so it's all about interpretation. So anyhow, so we'll kind of lean on ICHGCPs. So again, the, the important thing is here is a new part of the, um, the R6, excuse me, the E6 R2 is it states to encourage that the guideline was implemented to encourage implementation of improved and more efficient approaches to clinical trial design, conduct, oversight, recording, and reporting. This is what we want with all of our studies, is to improve all of those aspects. 
As far as um, there, is a, there is a section, it's called Adequate Resources, it's 4.2. And one of the responsibilities of the investigator and the institution is to ensure the integrity of the study tasks are performed and any data generated is good. So the point of that is, how do we know unless we check ourselves? Investigator's responsibility, this is, I'm sure, nothing new to anyone. The responsibility is to ensure the accuracy, completeness, legibility, and timeliness of data collection. Well, then how do you know if you don't check it? The only thing in the ICHGCPs that talks about quality is, not the only thing, but the, the focus really in the ICHGCPs is on the sponsor. But we all work for the sponsor, and whether it's we're the sponsor or we're someone, whether someone else is. So this really does apply to us, implementing and maintaining QA and QC systems. As I mentioned earlier, the FDA's view of quality management is a little bit vague, and I think that was mentioned earlier today. But the critical part is that, they, that the FDA expects adherence to good clinical practices, which are what? I mean, Good GCPs are two things, good data, protecting human subjects. If you do both of those, there's not one guideline that doesn't address one or the other or both of those. So again, it's, it's just looking at the big picture and assuring the quality. So Carolyn did a great job of talking us through what risk-based monitoring was. And as she alluded to, and is really important, this is where our quality management plans really come into play. Because what we are being expected to do, and some people will criticize this, is that as a site, we are expected to do some of our own monitoring. About eight years ago, when I was working with, um, with the CASG, totally funded by NIH, we were required to have all of our sites have quality management plans. And we had one West Nile virus study that had 70 sites. They all each had to have their own quality management plan. How were they going to review their data? How were they going to make sure they had all their regulatory documents in place? And so um, we learned early on how to, again, we began using quality management plans at that time. We complained, and a lot of coordinators complained, that this is making more work. We're taking the jobs away from the monitors so they don't have as much to do. Yes and no. If you really think about it, and I'll probably refer to this again, if you're a good coordinator or if you're, if you're a good site, you are already double-checking yourself, right? You're just not doing it in a systematic way that can be documented. So now it's taking what you've probably already been doing but trying to formalize it a little bit more. So it, it should not be that much extra work. And should, you know, it, it does make sense. If you find the problems yourselves, you can correct them more quickly. Um, and it, it does take the burden off of having to deal with a multitude of monitor visits. One of the key reasons for a quality management plan is as we go forward, and as you know right now, site selections become a big deal. Site selection, uh, pharmaceutical companies, want to enroll as quickly as possible in their trials, and they want it done well, and they want to know that you are abiding by the protocol, by, the, by all the guidelines and requirements that you are expected to adhere to. Well, if you have a site, so when the, site, when the pharmaceutical companies are, invest, are, are selecting sites, if you have quality management plans, they will look more favorably on you because they will have a sense that you are probably going to be more adherent to the protocol and to the guidelines. Again, you know, certainly site selection is based on facilities, personnel, potential subjects, and infrastructure, but it's really the rigorous site practices and the SOPs that you may have related to quality management that they will also begin, to, that they are beginning to look at. So what would, quality management plan do for you? Minimizes queries? Okay, that makes sense. And if you're, because you're going to be double checking what you're sending in to the sponsor, which in the end, queries cost us time. Queries cost us money. Um, and they improve the quality of data. 
you know, one of the things we won't be talking about at this program, but it's something that we all need to be thinking about, and that is, the, again, it's the cost of doing research, but the cost to you of doing research. So one thing I would say is that, just to start at the end of it, pharmaceutical companies, there has, was a report a number of months ago that pharmaceutical companies end up, it ends up costing them, them almost a million dollars a day when they go past the date they expected to have full enrollment. So if you are slow at enrolling because you don't have, you have sloppy processes, you in the end are gonna be costing the pharmaceutical company more money. Does that make sense? And so one of the things that when it comes to the, the cost of um, implementing a quality management plan, think about the time it's gonna take. If you're doing a pharmaceutical study, include in the cost of additional time for each subject for you to QC the data. The one thing that I often, it works is, again, the, the idea of a, a rigorous budget is very hard and it's very important. One of the rules of thumbs we've kind of gone by is to say, okay, for every CRF page, maybe we charge one hour. Well, that sounds pretty ridiculous because let's say there are 15 items on a CRF page and you record it after you take it, you, you record it on your source doc, and maybe, maybe then you record it to your CRF, or you're going to enter it in the database. At some point, the monitor's coming, so you're gonna go back and double check everything. At some point, somebody's gonna have some queries, so you're gonna have to go back again. Who's paying for that time? So as the, uh, filling out the form might take 15 minutes, but how many times are you gonna have to go back and pull it out, fix it, look at it again, talk to the monitor about it. So anyhow, and then, so I add that to this conversation about the CQMP, because theoretically, if you were charging an hour for a CRF page, well, theoretically, you know, some of that could be quality management, your time for double checking. And so you're still gonna get paid for, I mean, you're still going to be able to support yourself, and it's not going to cost you extra time and money. Did that make sense? If you don't have to deal with budgets, it may be a little bit vague, but the rigor with which we design budgets impacts everything. Because if you don't have time to do a CQMP, you're not gonna do it. Nobody's paying, it used to be, in the, and I'm going off on my, one of my soapboxes, that it used to be that in the medical world, there was extra money. And a coordinator, if she didn't make enough, if she didn't bring in enough money for doing a clinical trial, the School of Medicine would pay her salary not that way anymore. We have to figure out a way to cover our costs of everything we do. So back to what a CQMP will do for you. Um, it can increase the rigor, rigor of your regulatory files. Are they up to date? Um, you know, are, are they complete? Have you, com have you filled out all the forms correctly? assuring that the staff is competent. You're gonna be looking at training documents within your CQ CQMP, you should probably address that regularly. Reviewing, is everybody's training up to date? Um, and again, it provides a, do the other good thing it does for the site is it provides a document to the sponsor that you're a good site. And then hopefully we'll give you, you'll, you'll have designed it so well that you'll be doing such a good job, you can do more research. But you didn't hear me say that because I know you're already all overworked. So one of the things that you often hear is QA, QC. People will tell you, and I've heard it said, that QA is the same as QC. They're just interchangeable, but they're not. Think about if you made widgets. This is kind of the easiest way to, I think I can explain it. So you think of an assembly line, and this widget's coming down, and there's somebody standing, they're all made, and they're going, getting ready to be thrown into a box, and there's somebody double checking. They pick them up and look at them, and the ones that aren't good, they throw in a box and then they just make sure that the good ones go through. That is QC. That's taking the bad out at the time, stopping the bad from happening right away, because you catch it first. Um, QA, you go back to that bucket of items that you've, the, uh, widgets that you've thrown off to the <coughs> side, and you evaluate them, and you see what process can we change to make it, make all, you know, have fewer go into the bucket of, of unacceptable item, but widgets. In research, you know, I, I would look at this as um, subject visits. Let's say you find that subjects are missing 
one of the visits because it has a, a window of four days and you often, they, they don't come in on time. Well, then you evaluate, you, you know, you try and get that you, they miss a visit, you try to get them to come in the next day when they're still within the window. That may or may not happen. And maybe you'll get them to come in and that's fine. But just think of the time you've put into calling them when they already had a visit and you, you need to call them to get them to come in the next day. What you could do, that would be QC, because you're trying to fix the problem as you're going along. What should happen with QA related to that problem is you look at, you sit down with the team and you look at all the subjects who had out of visit windows and you try and figure out how do we need to, to get them to come in on time? Do we start sending letters two days before? Do we call them three days before? Again, you develop a plan to modify the process to have fewer problems. Key points, as we've talked about, you know, QCM, CQMPs are a requirement of ICHGCP. Um, it strengthens the data and the, of, that we're collecting and the subject safety. And in the end, CQMPs improve the quality, uh, the rigor, and the repeatability of the research. And again, as I said earlier, you're probably already doing this. It's a very simple process. It, it kind of goes back to what Carolyn mentioned about the, the plan. I'm going to get it backwards. The plan, do, act, and then you know, repeat. Um, but so what you do with a quality management plan is you create the plan, you implement it, you evaluate it, and you modify any processes you need to, and you start it over. Again, it's a very simple process. The com components of a clinical quality management plan. Who's going to implement it? These are the basic questions you're going to think about. What will be audited or reviewed? How often will it be audited or reviewed? What tools will be used in the audit or review? And how will the results of it be used? How, what we would then do with the results? Again, it's like you don't collect data without doing something with it. So when you put such a process in place, you have to identify how you're going to manage it going forward. The next two slides are just basically the simple outline of a plan. Describe what the plan will cover. Describe who has responsibility for the plan. Identify what the audit review frequency will be. List what documents and records will be reviewed. List what key indicators need to be reviewed. Describe the regulatory audit. List tools to be used. Describe your required training. Summarize and evaluate the audit review. And then regular, regularly, probably annually, review the entire plan. So I'm going to talk through most of these in more detail. But keep in mind, you're going to, what you're going to do is write a plan where maybe every three months within that plan, it says every three months we're going to review. And again, let me step back. And it's also the, the frequency may be dependent on the type of protocol. There are some sites who want to write one quality management plan and have it apply to every single protocol. That might work depending on the variability of the different kinds of protocols that you do. If you do a natural history observational study that enrolls five subjects every five months or every six months, do you need to take time to um, rigorously review the activity on that protocol? Where if you have a study that's enrolling 100 subjects a month, you're going to want to be more on top of it and spend more time, maybe every two weeks, reviewing consent forms. Just double check that everything's going well. So again, variability is, is pretty important. When, again, so when, as I was just describing, when you look at CQMPs, you need to understand what protocol this is for. Again, is it going to be protocol specific or will it be generic? Issues of related to study design are very important in understanding um, what the scope of the plan will be. Responsibility and delegation. Who's going to do it? You know, ultimately, as always, principal investigators tend to be the, the key lead, the key responsible individual. However, who's going to be reviewing the documents? Who's going to be documenting everything? Who's going to be making sure that it gets done? Um, 
and what tasks will need to be done. Those will all be described in the plan. In some of the plans that we've done, you know, the PI is responsible for the whole plan, but study coordinator A will be managing the regulatory review and the consent review. Study coordinator B will be doing uh, the data reviews and will be looking at endpoints and eligibility maybe. But again, that would be within the plan. One of the, um, one of the challenges, because this is a QA, QC system, in the ideal world, if you're running a study, you're going to have somebody else delegated to review what you've done. Most of us, and if you're like me, most of the time when I was doing research, I was the only coordinator. I didn't have anybody in the next office or at the next desk who wasn't doing my study who could be my QC person. Sometimes we're just handicapped with that, and that's the way it has to be. And it, it can be OK, because you are, you know, if you, because what's going to happen is if you screw up auditing your own study, it's going to come out in the end. You know, somebody's, it's going to be identified if, in fact, you have not audited your, your data correctly. But in theory, in the best of worlds, and with as much money as we had, and if, if we could interconnect with each other more, we would have somebody else do the review of our data. I've already talked about um, QA and QC, but you can have within your plan how frequently are we going to, um, you know, do the QC of each of the, of the different, of different indicators? And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then how frequently might we change our processes? And maybe you won't even document how quickly you'll change your processes or when you'll do a QA, because that could very well be dependent on what you'd find in the QC. And I hope if, any, if, I, if I lose you all, please raise your hand or yell at me. So record selection or data selection. You know, what, what are you going to, what records are you going to use? You know, you would put this in your plan. You're going to use the medical record. You're going to use your research record. If you're doing a study that doesn't, you, you're, it's not in the hospital and there's no medical record, you wouldn't include it here. You would just say you're going to review the research record. Um, you're going to review your your regulatory documents. There's also the question about what percent of the records to be audited. If this is a pivotal study, if it's in children, you're probably going to want to do 100% um, of everything. Just It's up to you. But again, you'll know better when you, when you evaluate the risk that Carolyn <coughs> talked about as to what needs to be reviewed and how much of the data. <clears throat> if it's a high enrolling behavioral study, you know, 20% might be enough. But talk to your team. Don't make, you know, this is something that, again, it was mentioned earlier today. This is a team effort. Um, no one person should be held responsible for making all the decisions when it comes to even building these plans. Key quality indicators, a critical part of a quality management plan. You know, what are you going to look at? You need to select the items that are important to you, that you think would be audited by the FDA if it's a drug study, that are part of the primary outcome measures. Because if you don't, if you fail your primary outcome measures, primary and secondary specifically, you're, you, know, you're, you're, you will have failed. So just, this is just a, a short list of possible quality indicators. Um, there's certainly the informed consent process and the documentation thereof. Query resolution, are you, are you resolving queries in a, in a timely manner? Study product accountability, you know, who's looking at the drugs? Are you going to the pharmacy to make sure that everything's in order? Are you checking with the pharmacist to make sure that the accountability is being done? Because as part of the research team, you slash the PI are responsible for making sure the pharmacist gets done what he or she need to do. Temperature logs, are those good? Have all AEs and SAEs been um, identified? You know, to, to have, depending on the nature of your protocol, you could have in your quality management plan that every two weeks you're going to look at X number of subjects to make sure that no SAEs have been reported in their medical record. Um, you're going to look, maybe you'll review your research record to see if there have been any overlooked events that were reported by the subject that should have been reported as an SAE. Specimen collection process, process documentation. Um, 
you know, if the, if the sponsor says process your, your blood in the centrifuge for 20 minutes at, you know, a minus 4 um, degree centrifuge, or probably not a minus 4, probably just a 4 degree centri centigrade uh, centrifuge, um, then you better have documented that. If that's what they wanted you to do, it should be documented somewhere, or you have, whether it's a checklist or, or whatever, but you would go back and make sure you're doing that. This will show the credibility of your data. Visit within, visits within Windows and all assessments completed. The one that isn't on here and somehow it dropped off was protocol deviations. Looking at your protocol deviations. We've said this before, protocol de I, or at least I have, protocol deviations are not bad. They, they can be if you've blatantly done something wrong, but all the protocol deviations are is how a study took place. What happened during the course of a study that wasn't according to how the protocol was written? So most of the time, it's going to be things out of your control, or many times it will. But the sponsor, the FDA, everybody needs to know why the study maybe didn't go according to how it was written. So again, looking at those, compiling those for either a protocol, you can also compile them, compile them for all of your protocols and say, what is the frequency of you know, temperature excursions from on, the, on the freezer. Gosh, maybe we need a new freezer. When you only see one time point, you don't know if there's a major problem. But when you put everything together, you can look at this and evaluate yourself on your protocol deviations. Regulatory review, um, again, pretty basic. Everything that's required is a regulatory document from um, gosh, your IRB, medical license, CVs, training, and anything that needs to be renewed. You need to be looking at this to make sure your file's complete. Now, what I would have in the, um, the, the monitor plan would be that maybe every six months or every three months, someone sits down, takes 20 minutes to just review, review the file, make sure it's complete, make sure everything's in order, make sure that nobody's that IRBs are, are, aren't expired, that medical licenses aren't expired. Again, doing a hands-on look at those documents. We, we uh, have what we often call a best friend form, this is simply a regulatory checklist. And again, using that to make sure that all the documents are complete. In your monitor plan, you're going to talk about the tools and checklists you might use and they should be part of the plan. Um, you should develop these before you start. I mean, the quality management plan needs to be put in place at the very beginning of a study. As you know, it, it, what it's really doing for you is getting you ready for an FDA audit or an audit down the road. So you're better off starting off on the right foot. So what tools might be helpful? An informed consent tool, by that I mean a form that would be checked that you would look when you do a review of your, your IRB, you'd make sure the dates were correct, you'd make the, and, and on the forms that everything was signed. Um, again, that's what I mean by an informed consent tool. You would also, on that tool would also be that you would document that all, for each of the subjects, the ones you're going to be monitoring, um, that each of them have a, a consent, excuse me, yes, a consent narrative, uh, documentation of what was said to the subject. Chart review tool, this is really more about the data. It's, it's another part of looking at the data and that the charts are complete. Um, again, I, we have some tools, but you know, you know how you run your office. One of the things they often say about the FDA is, you know, they're going to come and they're going to find problems. One of the things they hate the most is if they come and look at your files and they're a mess. They're not going to hunt for anything. So reviewing your charts to make sure that everything is organized and systematically in a, set up so that it, things could be found, so that the FDA could find what they're looking for. A regulatory review tool, again, check, uh, checklist of things you need to be looking at when you do your regulatory review. Visit remind, again, it's called a reminder worksheet, but what does, um, and, and a lot of sites have this, that if it's in your protocol, if it's in your SOP that you are going to remind subjects um, of their upcoming visits, you need to adhere to that. And so you might have a checklist where you document that, yes, we've adhered to our SOP. 
uh, case report forms and source document checklist. Is everything complete? Are things signed? Is there continuity? External monitor report review. You know, this is something that often gets lost, is the external monitor report. As much as we don't, as much as we are not thrilled with monitors coming to see us, because they take up our time um, and create more work for us, the report they send to you is going to be part of a master file. The report they send to you is something you should take seriously. And so to take that report and make another list of all the problems that they identified on the report to share with your team is another way of doing quality management. And you could also put that in your, your monitor plan that you will review as a team every, quali every monitor report that comes through. Now see, you're probably already doing that. But by putting it on a plan and then documenting that you have done that will assure not only you, but it assures the sponsor that you are, are being very rigorous with the implementation of the protocol. There should be a, you know, certainly a place to identify staff training and qualifications. I think this is probably the easiest one. Um, we know that there are, there's a buttload of education that we have to do. I mean, we've got the federal government expects certain things, sponsors expect certain things, the institution does, um, and there may be local, local specifications that you're required to do for training. So again, knowing all of those and making sure that those are all up to date. But it, defining that in your quality management plan. So depending on how you write your plan, you also have to have a summary report of every time you, you do the task you said you were going to do. So you have a plan. It's great to have a plan, but if you don't document that you did it, it's not of much use. So that's the whole point of having a, um, a report. Um, and there could be multiple ones because if you think about it, if you're doing regulatory, maybe you're only going to check your regulatory every three to six months because that really doesn't change very much. Maybe you're going to, and depending on, as I said earlier, the enrollment rate of a study, maybe you're going to uh, look at consent forms on a monthly basis. So you would have a report for each of those that in your quality management plan, you will state when you're going to generate the report and that the PI will have access to it or that the study team will review it. So think about just the process that you're going to be going through. The other thing is after a period of time, you may need to revise your quality management plan. And that will be based on what you find. As a, acting as a sponsor, when we had a site who, they had a quality management plan, that was great. Suddenly we found that they were not submitting their specimens on time. And so what we did, we asked them to fix their quality management plan, to put in there that on a biweekly basis, they would double check that the specimens had been sent. They didn't have that on their plan before, but we used the plan as a means of corrective action. And so when we did, so we had to do, a, again, as the sponsor, had to ask the site to do a corrective action plan. Part of that was implementing and um, updating their quality management plan. Does that make sense? Do you know the difference between those two? Okay. And as I mentioned before, and even without corrective action, it may be necessary to have a, um, an annual evaluation of the CQMP, just to make sure that all the reports that were generated during the year don't point to a need to change your quality management plan. And as you all probably know, you know, it usually you have a quality management plan and how this whole process takes place may be managed by an SOP, but your quality management plan is going to be specific. Most of the time they're specific to protocols. Again, you don't have to do it that way, but there could be a master SOP that says we're going to, you know, adhere to these guidelines when we <clears throat> develop the plans. So the future, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it's going to become part of site selection possibly. So sponsors are getting more and more selective. An organization that I'm involved with is the, um, the ACRES, which is they have this committee um, that's put together 
to identify how to accredit institutions and set standards, so they call it SASE. They're getting ready to roll out some pilots this year <clears throat> whereby we have set standards for what institutions should have in place in order to be accredited. It's more, mostly, it's very much like joint commission. To be a hospital, to be a hospital that receives Medicare, you have to have a joint commission accreditation, right? The IRBs are being accredited now. They're moving toward accrediting institutions who do research to make sure that they have everything in place. This will provide many benefits in that it'll minimize, it'll, it'll show sponsors who is the most, what, the most credible sites because they will have quality management plans in place. I mean, that's probably going to be one of the things that's absolutely required to be accredited. Um, and it will help you as a site. I just think if you're accredited and the sponsors know you have all this stuff and that they know that you're in, um, in good standing, then chances are you'll be more quickly selected to be part of research, um, research protocols. So it's a really, it, and it's going, it's, this is an international effort. Um, they're looking at trying to accredit institutions around the world. So we'll see where it goes. So just kind of watch for it. But they really are beginning, they're going to be piloting it. Um, and there's an article, going to be an article next month in New England Journal of Medicine about this. It hasn't been published yet. So again, it's, we're going back, do we go back to the beginning? What are we trying to do? <clears throat> trying to improve the standard of research. How are we doing that? By improving how we do it. And all of us coming to the same standard as best we can. So really developing a plan, um, it's not all that hard. But you have to think about it. You have to look at what are the factors that are critical for you to keep reviewing um, on a continuous basis. With risk-based monitoring, this is, again, going to become a paramount um, effort. So we've talked about CQMPs and how important they are. The basics of the CQMP, uh, QA, QC, who, what, when, where, how, how are you supposed to do this, and what will it take? Really developing a QCMP is very much like plan, do, check, and act, um, as Carolyn described. It's given a plan what you're going to do, you do it, you evaluate it, and then you implement the change and you go back and do it again. It's not a one and done, it's a continuous effort. Um, it's not a single person effort, it's a team effort. Has, and I didn't even ask you all, has it, does anybody, is anybody using quality management plans internal? Have you been satisfied with them or are they a pain in the butt? You can say they're a pain in the butt, it's okay. <clears throat> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good. It becomes second nature, doesn't it? I mean, it, it's just it, because, again, you all are already doing it, I would imagine. It's just it's not systematic and formal. Um, does anyone have any questions? So I, I, please feel free to contact me. I, I know I'm finishing a bit early. Um, I think with the, the scope and the direction of research right now, this is really the next step. This is the next. And, this, and the CQMPs are often called the, a part of a, the regulatory file. So consider this on your regulatory list of, of documents you may need. It's important, again, I'll repeat it one more time. The team needs to be involved in this, from developing it to determining what needs to be reviewed and then for evaluating it in the end. Thank you. Oh. For the quality plan and your assessment tools, do you keep those in the MOOC docs for that study? Are they auditable? What, uh, yeah, that's a good question. To date, we have kept them separate from what would be auditable by the FDA. Because this is an internal process. Um, it's not, if we, it's like you're just, it's like you're trying to you know, fix a problem that you already created. You're going to fix it before it's a problem. 
you know, the, the, because what's going to be apparent to the FDA, let's say you identify that you're failing to do your consenting right. You're going to catch it early, but you're still going to have those people who were consented incorrectly, and the FDA will see that. But you're going to correct it so there won't be any other problems. But they don't, um, they don't need to see it now. Will they ask? I don't know. Will they ask if you have a CQMP? They might. Um, I don't know that I've not talked to anyone yet who's had an FDA audit where um, <clears throat> this was asked of them. Doesn't mean it won't happen in the future, but um, it is, again, it hasn't been to date. So I do consider one of those documents that you just keep to yourself in a separate file. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. CQ, CQMP. So there. Is, <laughs> so a lot of times, yes and no. We keep those separate. Usually, there's a um, statistical analysis plan, a data management plan, which to date we have kept separate from the clinical implementation plan, which is really more what this is. Now, could it be included? Yes. You know, it would be dis it would be dependent on your data management group and whether. But they need to have a quality management plan in place, just as you said, that when data comes in and it's queryable quickly as we do these um, remote um, data um, reviews. So again, to date, we haven't put that sort of thing in our quality management plans, but it doesn't mean it couldn't happen. Carolyn, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, do you Thank you.